Sound check. Check one. Check two. Hello, Brenda. How are you? Great. Thanks so much for having me here. This is fabulous to be in Australia again. Yeah. <laughs> Big, and, and it was the, the, the time that we think we might have met in person. Um, well, you were here in Australia and you've been here. I was. I was at uh, the University of Southern Queensland in Toowoomba. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And we just figured that out, that we probably met. <laughs> we, we possibly met. I certainly... I'm pretty sure I saw you play piano. We'll talk more about that today. Um, at a at a, a concert that you did while I was teaching at a summer school, you were teaching a summer workshop alongside um, Jeannie Lavetri. Um, but of course, you were we 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 have um, dual fr friends um, of 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 the same, uh, namely Dr. Melissa Forbes. Um, and mm -hmm. Dr. Dale Cox, um, who yes. we both know and both know quite well. Um, and uh, hello to both of those ladies if they have the chance to watch uh, watch the show. Brenda, I've, I've known, but I actually knew kind of of you before that possible meeting um, because you you uh, were on the radar for me, you know, way before then. And, and in part because you, you you've got this wonderful dual existence of being this amazing performer, pianist, accompanist, and singing teacher to boot. Can you tell us a bit more about you and how you came to be? And because, you know, we'll let the cat out of the bag. You're a Canadian living in New York. Yeah. I am. Yeah. And I, you know, I started out normally enough doing what people do, taking piano lessons when I was a kid and was never particularly good at it or, you know, notable for doing it. Um, but when I was about 15, my band director played Oscar Peterson, who you can see is over my head right here. <laughs> and I was like, wow, I think I want to be a jazz musician. And so it was at that moment where I went from being a mediocre classical piano player to being obsessed with jazz. And I ended up going, moving to Toronto and doing my undergraduate degree in jazz piano. And, you know, that whole time I <clears throat> felt like I wanted to be a singer too, but because at that time in the nineties, Diana Krall was all the rage, everybody would compare me to Diana Krall. And I really didn't want, I mean, what a luxury to be you know, one of the great <laughs> artists that has ever, you know, there most are, successful jazz artist. There are worse time. things in life, aren't there, than to be compared with Diana Kroll. Right, but there weren't a lot of women that were playing jazz piano, yeah. and I really wanted people to listen to me and say, or see me and say, oh, you you're sound like just like Bud Powell instead of thinking that I'm a girl who's going to be singing with the band. Okay. So I quite literally sang in a closet. I was a closeted singer. There was a, they had a small music library that was just a walk-in closet, and I used to go in there and put Carmen McRae records on and sing my head off. And so it wasn't until after I had graduated that I ever sang in public. Um, and then a shortly after that, a few years later, I decided that I needed to see the world. And so I quit my job as a ballet pianist and gave up all my gigs and um, decided to go on a cruise ship. So I became, did sing along piano bar uh, for a couple of years out there. And then when that was sort of coming to an end, I had enough money saved up. So I moved to New York to, cause it's jazz Mecca here. And, you know, during that time, got very interested in vocal pedagogy, started taking my singing a lot more seriously mm. and um, have done a lot of really interesting things in music. I, I, I have a lot of interests. I get um, very, very excited and interested in things and I'll go on a, on a jag with it I'll go on a tangent. And I was a classical choral conductor at a college for a couple of years and um, I recorded a bunch of albums and toured all over the world as a band leader and as a side person. and. You know, I've taught early childhood music. I've taught, you know, beginner piano. I did eight years as a summer. I mean, I literally have, if there's a gig, I have done it. Wow. <laughs> everything. I've never been in a mariachi band. But besides <laughs> that, I've pretty much, I've pretty much done, done everything. And, you know, it, teaching was something that I got into later. I wasn't in my mid twenties when I really started getting more serious about yeah. teaching and realized that it was a real creative outlet for me. So I sort of kind of done a little bit of everything. I love, I love that. You found teaching a real creative outlet. And can I, 
I, I think that the reason I love that is because it suddenly resonated with me. People have often asked mm -hmm. me, oh, why, why don't you, because I don't um, professionally gig anymore. Um, uh, but I think that's in part because I I'm, I'm feel quite creatively fulfilled in my teaching. I love the way you just put that. That's I've never heard it stated like that. Thank you. That's oh, interesting. That's, I I do. I find it, and you know, I had okay teaching when I was coming up, but I never really had anyone break it down to me in a mm, way that was helpful. So I mm. spent a lot of time, like you know, roaming the desert looking for water sources. Like I, I just, <laughs> I I didn't have a lot of really really clear direction, and so I had to figure a lot of things out the hard way. And so I've kind of made it my mission to figure out the fastest possible way, the most efficient way to be able to get people to um, to learn. And that means that I've created different notational systems that help people if they're not able to read music or um, trying to find new ways to kind of creatively um, teach theory in a way that's more approachable. I, I've just tried to make everything a lot more approachable. And I, I work with a really broad background of people, lots of professionals and voice teachers teaching the piano, Broadway singers, etc. But also, you know, avocational people who are just singing because they love it or want to learn some piano because it was their childhood dream. And, yeah. you know, I find the pursuit of it is really, really creative. And every student comes in with their own thumbprint of what they need and I get to create a course of action for them. So it yeah. really scratches an itch for me creatively. What, what was it purely that, that you discovered you, your love for teaching around the creativity? What, what, what started your journey towards the, the teaching? Was it, you know, a lot of teachers find themselves, you know, singing teachers I'm referring to now, kind of find themselves needing to teach to earn a quid and that's pure, more than acceptable. Um, what, what started your journey in teaching singers, but also and, and a big part of our discussion today is uh, t teaching singers to play piano and self accompany. Mm -hmm. What started that journey for you? Well, when I was getting ready to graduate from Manhattan School of Music, um, there was a pedagogy course that we took. Chris Rosenberg, who's a wonderful guitar player, um, mm. had taught the course and had been teaching it for years. And he presented pedagogy. I didn't really know that pedagogy was a thing. I just thought you teach, but pedagogy, thinking of the art of teaching, you know, of the um, studying different methodologies and how do you make it palatable and what does it mean to be a teacher it it really changed it from an oh god I don't want to teach little kids piano um, but really thinking of it as as the art form and at the end of my time I was planning to go back on the cruise ship again for the summer and he said have you ever thought about teaching at a music festival and so it was my first summer teaching at what ended up becoming the New York Summer Music Festival I taught for six weeks I was there as voice and piano teacher and um, that was it. I was hooked. All these kids had never played jazz before. People who were great singers who had never sung in a jazz choir before. Um, I got to really learn on the fly, running jazz ensembles, playing in a big band with half the kids were students in the group, half were um, faculty members, and figuring out how do I get people to sound good. They're only there a lot of them two weeks. How can I get them to make a good sound? How can I get them to feel comfortable about improvising? How can I get them to learn the music? I was writing all the music for the group. Um, it, it was really, that was really where I was eating, sleeping, and breathing it. I mean, I was just teaching all day, and uh, that was really where I got very, very excited about it. The, the thing that strikes me about that story, and, and I want you to correct me if this was not the case, but the thing that strikes me about that, let's call it your origin story, was, <laughs> right. is, is, it happened in an environment of play, you know, in one yeah. sense, you know, when we're at a, a summer camp, you, you said it was that, that, you know, the, the participants and you, there's, there's, there's a lot of non pressure there, isn't there really? Cause you're there to, to just enjoy the music, to enjoy the creative process, as opposed mm -hmm. to needing to be there to follow a structured regime that, there's a whole heap of boxes that need to be ticked and there's a place for that as well. But it strikes me that you discovered this creativity in a, in a, in a space and environment that really was about enjoyment and fun and exploration. 
Right, and I think more than that, it was that they didn't have a budget to buy music <laughs> or hire a person who was better at singing than me. Do you know what I'm like? It was. I'd like to say that it was some kind. Of, we were joking about highfalutin. This was like not a highbrow decision that they said that we're going to make this play-based environment. This was like we don't have any money to pay for two people. We don't have any music. <laughs> And when I was like, well, what do I do? They're like, I don't know. There's a show at the end of the two weeks. Figure it out. And yeah. so yeah. I ended up writing all of the music for them because there wasn't any music. Wow. And I didn't, you know, I didn't, I figured I may as well just write it. And I'd never written choral music before. So all of it was kind of done by, and this is the ent my entire career is like, you show up, you say, I'll take the gig <laughs> and you show up and you learn the gig. <laughs> That's how it was on the cruise ship, too. I had never, ever done sing-along piano bar until I set foot on the cruise ship. And it's a fake it till you make it kind of situation. I was like, oh, if they fire, if they kick me off this boat, I got nowhere to go. I gave my apartment up. I have no job. Well, you, you, so. you, but, the, but the great thing about that is that yeah. you really do get to make it your own, don't you? I mean, you're not, yeah. you, you, yeah. you, you're, you're not, you know, just doing it like the person before you or, or what you might, you know, you just step into the space and if you've got the the sense of of being able to abandon yourself to the experience which evidently you have you've had a number of experiences where this has worked for you then yeah that's that's a lot of fun that's a lot of fun um right and this is where i love like the, this is where versatility comes into play like that's my whole that's my whole shtick is yeah you know, you start out with certain experiences and then you expand upon them and one experience leads to another leads to another and you're constantly drawing on skills that you have yes. or reaching out for a tool that you don't have and then having to gather the tool. Yeah. So I feel like it's a really great, it's, it's just been a really fun way to be able to go about my career. It's been sort of an unusual little career I've had, but... Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've enjoyed every minute of it. Truly, Talk, talking of tools, let's 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 focus in on singers developing the tool of of the piano skills. And and evidently, you know, you 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 came to your scenarios with those schools in play. But so mm -hmm. many people who are watching the show, um, that's not been their experience. What 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 do you? What are the immediate things that come to mind as the main challenges facing singers and 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 many many people watching our show that they've not had um, had the opportunity to have you know professional lessons of any degree they've not had an, uh, a musical upbringing uh, they're avocational um, as you say what are the main challenges facing um, the general populace in learning piano skills? I think the biggest problem, and this, this goes with my professional students, voice teachers like you and I who have struggled with piano skills, but this is also for our avocational people, is that piano seems like it's really hard. It seems really intimidating. And when you start throwing the words music theory or ear training around, I think there's such a negative connotation that it's something, you know, music theory is something that's taught by an old man with a goatee and the book is thick and you blow the dust off of it and it's very challenging. Hang, hang on, hang on. Piano exercise. Hang, hang on. Oh, sorry. This, uh, this is an old man with a goatee. No, 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 not you. <laughs> you have a ponytail, so you're exempt. You, you do not resemble this. Yeah, the ponytail precludes you from this one. But, you know, we know, we all know the music theory. And that piano lessons feel like it's such a thing. And I know so many people who have signed up for piano lessons and there's a method book and there's hand and exercises yeah. and there's scales and there's all this complicated material associated with it that people say it's going to be five years before I can play anything. And that's really been my beef um, just in general with, with the way piano gets taught because what ends up happening is People study piano with pianists, which is makes sense, except there's a difference between being what I call a capital P pianist, which is someone who is going to play piano as their main thing, yeah. somebody who's going to play classical music or something like that, versus what I call PSL, which is piano as a second language, yeah. right? Okay. Piano <laughs> as a way to support either songwriting or singing or voice teaching or 
um, you know, general music teaching or choral conducting, that the piano that you use in those categories is different. And so while anybody can take the five years and learn all the challenging skills, that's totally fine, but I don't recommend that anybody start there. And so what I've ended up doing is um, kind of trying to unravel the whole process and go back to, well, what is what do people actually need? What are those actual skills that they need? And working from there. And then saying, well, if those are the skills they need, how can we get them to be able to play the piano immediately? Mm -hmm. Not practice scales for six months before you play a, a difficult song, but how can you play a song right away on the first lesson? How can you accompany yourself immediately? How can you use it as a tool? And so that's that's really been the the journey for me. Yeah, and and I'm trying to trying to approach this conversation as as someone who might be watching, and I'm I'm thinking to myself, okay, well tell me tell me tell me the end results. What what are the main benefits that I'm going to gain? You know, what's what's the product we're going to talk about the process i'm sure but mm -hmm. right right from the get-go let's talk about what 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 are the main benefits what is what is it going to contribute to me as a singer to have these skills in place the number one thing is sitting down at the piano and being able to sing and play any song you want that's it i can i can get i'll tell you other stuff too <laughs> But that's the thing. That's a pretty, and that's magic, a pretty good thing, right? It's pretty, it's pretty <coughs> huge. Yeah. And the magical thing to be able to see, and this happens constantly in my private studio, through my membership, even through videos on my YouTube channel where people are like, wow, I can't believe it. I sat, I've always wanted to play this Beatles song, now I can play it. Or, boy, I went to the Taylor Swift concert and I can't believe I can sing and play that song. Or all of these songs I've always wanted to play. That's what it is. And what it means is that you can play and sing for a vast amount of enjoyment. It means that you can play or sing for others. Like you'll be the person that sits down at the birthday party and plays and sings happy birthday. Or um, a, a family member of ours um, who was in hospice care, she wanted a special song to be sung to her. And imagine what it feels like to be able to sit down and sing and play that for someone. Or to be able to have a student who wants to surprise her son at his wedding by singing and playing their special song. That's magic. That's magic. That is magic. You know? Yeah. And that's why, I mean, that's magic. It's a magical thing. And mm. it really isn't that big of a deal to be able to do it. And so right off the bat, in big, bold letters, neon sign, like that. That's the thing. You that's know, the thing. It's, it's really magical. Beyond that, the piano is, in my opinion, I know you're a guitar player, the most efficient and easiest way to be able to understand music theory and to be able to really develop ear training. And what we mean by ear training isn't those terrible tests where you're like, major third, minor sixth, you know, like not that, but ear I training get, is- I get can... shivers from my from my time in my you know, undergrad. Know. Oh. It's so terrible. Oh. <laughs> but you know, Ear training skills to be able to hear a melody and be able to play it on the piano or yeah. to be able to hear a melody and be able to harmonize yeah. it yeah. or to be able to hear a melody and be able to remember it better yeah. or to be able to hear a melody and write it down, you know, to have that kind of intelligence or hear someone playing chords and be able to sing on top of it because yes. you understand how that is. Yeah. And because the piano is so visual, <clears throat> You can see the intervals. Yeah. You can see what you're playing. Yes. You can develop that spatial awareness of it. Yeah. And so, you know, I think that it's really the magic, the, the magic instrument for all of that. And honestly, it's not that hard to learn. Can I just... And I will go to my grave saying that. Can I just affirm <laughs> it's that? It's not you that know, hard. I'm going to affirm that. As a guitar player, um, I, um, uh, I'm often asked by people parents who say oh you know little jenny little jimmy they're wanting to you know get into singing they're wanting to get into music what should i do i always encourage piano um during mm -hmm. during childhood this is something i did with my own children they all um mm -hmm. had uh, piano lessons um because in part because i know what i lacked in my upbringing musically um, and 
this is I'm able to accompany myself on a guitar quite competently um, but piano skills is exactly what you just said it's about that that level of musicianship that you get to visually comprehend that a guitar certainly a guitar can't give you yes you can carry your guitar and play it around a campfire but you can't it doesn't have the same connection musically um, as a piano does so no absolutely it's the, it's the visual i tell you it's the visual because if the notes are going higher they're this way they're going lower they're this way the notes are close together you can see it yes and it's that connection to it that really yeah. really makes a difference absolutely yeah yes it's a very it is it is a very powerful instrument on on that level um T talk us through because your your approach is unique you you approach mm -hmm. the teaching of of these skills um in your own way can you can you kind of step us through for someone that might be interested step us through what are going to be those phases that you take a person through the learning process mm -hmm. so the first thing is just becoming familiar with the topography of the instrument yeah and you know the basics of like the technical how your hands work how do you sit I address that right off the bat. We go right into that. And it, it's not hours of conversation. It's like move the bench, sit mm. here, do the this. This is what your hands look like. We're good to go. And then the first thing that I do is teach five finger <clears throat> position. And if you're not aware of what five finger position, it basically means that you plop your five fingers <clears throat> on the piano and your finger, each finger is on the five notes in a row. So you're not <clears throat> skipping any notes. You're just in the five, the five finger position. And I teach C major first and we do a bunch of very simple five finger exercises to get that position. And the five finger hand position is really, really important because your hand is going to be in this position. I look like a monster, but you're putting your hand in this, in this position and you're keeping it that way because so many of the chords you play are going to be in this position. So we're establishing that position right away. And of course, inside these little five finger scales and patterns are the triads, because if I play one, three, five, boom, there's your chord. So within usually 20 or 25 minutes um, of the first lesson, and certainly very early on in all of my um, piano courses, you know, you're playing songs because you think of how many songs are diatonic. Diatonic means within the key. If you can play a few chords in the key of C, you can literally play thousands and thousands of songs. <laughs> you know, we could make a list of all the songs that you can play that are, are just those. And so that's generally what we do first. <laughs> and then we take those patterns into the key of F or the key of G until you're able to play a variety of songs. So right off the bat, you can play songs. You're playing songs from day one. Once that process starts uh, and you start working on learning major and minor chords, which I teach intervallically because, again, I feel like key signatures can really slow the works down. So I don't start with that. But understanding that scales are made up of certain intervals and the interval is a distance between two notes. And so for the first five notes of the major scale, it goes whole step, whole step, half step, whole step. And once you can play that five finger pattern in all the keys, then you can play every major triad. And then once you can play your major chords or your major triads, all you have to do is lower the third to make it minor. Mm. Then you can play your major and minor chords in all 12 keys. And then that means you can play every song <laughs> because that's all there is. Pretty much. And if you never go any further than that, that's perfectly fine, yeah. right? That's all you need to do. And if, if for you, that's enough to scratch the itch of the Beatles songs or the Taylor Swift or the Elton John or whatever, that's fine. Once that material is in play, I start to weave in accompaniment strategies. And what accompaniment strategies are is just the rhythmic um, component of it. And so when we're doing this as a solo pianist, meaning you're not playing with the band, what we're doing is we're trying to make ourselves sound like the band sounds by playing the groove. And so if I'm playing Let It Be by the Beatles, I'd go one, two, and three, four, and one, two, and three, four, and. And if I were playing, um, you know, What's Up by Four Non Blondes, I'd be going ba, 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 ba. 
ba 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 and so learning mm. enough of those rhythmic patterns and for most people you don't need more than three or four of those to cover a huge range of songs and so that's how I like to start out and within you know a few lessons or within my online courses usually within a couple of weeks people can play a ton of songs I mean a ton and if that's where people want to finish then and that's all they want to do they're great they'll be happy they can play all the songs and if they want to go further they can but this foundation I think is the most efficient way to get people to play that's I love that sort of step like phase as you sort of in slowly but surely immersing people into the process which is mm -hmm. which is just it's I, I'm I I hope you won't be take any offense from this because I mean it as a compliment it's wonderfully simple it's yeah. not complex and right. I yeah I think that's the that, point the, the 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 more I I watch pedagogy evolve um, the more simple it seems to be delivered, you know, we, we're really, you know, I think the skill of a good pedagogue is to be able to take what is, if you really get into the finicky nitty gritty, it's quite complex, but deliver it in a really simple, accessible way. I think that, mm -hmm. you know, is the ingredients for good learning. Dare I, Absolutely. dare I move us to the 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 well, not necessarily the next phase in your approach but a part of the this because i i I'm, I'm i'll break into a cold sweat when we start talking about musicianship um mm -hmm. <laughs> because you know i i i might have some so uh, th there was trauma involved in my <laughs> musicianship always learning. there always is always <laughs> oh, dear. every time me, me, every time because the, who's teaching who's teaching musicianship courses theory professors the the the, right? the singers and the drummers we all in in our musicianship classes we all you know you just see us all go white as a sheet as we walked into the space what what are you what approach are you taking to musicianship and just maybe unpack for us what we what we mean by musicianship for those who may not be up with the lingo <clears throat> so musicianship is musical intelligence yeah. and it's musical intelligence that is taught it's not a talent it's something that mm. is learnable yeah and what that means is that you have an, a certain understanding of music theory and not music theory in the book with the dust and the goatee and the you know like not <laughs> that but of music we, theory we have to stop referencing the goatee sorry, no, the goatee <laughs> Sorry, but it's, that's who it is. It's like the, with the white hair and the, you know, and the jacket and the, no, no, you've got the ponytail. You are, exactly. <laughs> but like, you know, that, that the music theory, that's really what I call vocational music theory. It's music theory for the people. It's music theory for working and musicianship encompasses your understanding of where you are within a key, understanding how scales are made up, what makes them up. Um, having an understanding for being able to find the pulse and the rhythm of music, all of these things count as musicianship. Why, why do you think it's such a struggle to enrich musicianship skills? Like what, what is it that creates that sense of disconnect, I guess, for many s singers, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> drummers? What, yeah. you know, what, what, sorry, drummers, if you're a drummer that has really high musicianship skills, I mean, you know, events, um, what, and, and, and to all the people with goatees out there, we probably, right, right. <laughs> music theory teachers. Well, I would say the biggest issue is that in so many environments, music theory is, or music history, or sorry, musicianship is being taught by music theory professors. Yeah. And a lot of times what those courses in college and maybe your viewers or people watching or listening to this will have had the same experience that they go to their musicianship class and they're just being tested yeah. all the time. They're yeah. just being tested. Oh, relentlessly. So, uh, that's what, that's what happens. And yeah. so you're just sitting there getting test after test after test. But 
from my experience, I'm a big um, Kodai person. Mm -hmm. um, and Kodai uh, was a pedagogue who was very, very adamant about learning solfege and using the hand signs and understanding solfege, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, if you're not aware of what solfege is. And the purpose of solfege is giving an understanding to the relationship between the notes and the major scale. Yeah. And <laughs> what I find is that even though solfege seems like something for classical singers, it's often taught to children and lots of people who get taught it don't understand what it's for. They do the hand signs, they don't get it. But understanding and being able to feel your way through the major scale, to be able mm. to say, mm. I know what the second note of the major mm. scale feels like. I know what the fourth degree of the major scale, this is the hand sign for it, that it naturally resolves down to the third of the chord, mm -hmm. that do is home, that mm. you have that strong feeling, that T resolves up to do, what those hand signs are for. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of, again, magic that really helps people to be able to understand how music works. Yeah. And again, not something that you need to go all the way in, that yeah. you need to be able to sing the chromatic scale and movable do solfege, or that you even have to sight read. But I find that having people get used to hearing notes, singing them, finding them on the piano, hearing bass notes, singing them, finding them on the piano, um, being able to do some things in solfege to be able to really break that apart. And then to take a similar stance, a very vocational stance with rhythm, where you're able to find the pulse of a song, to be able to identify how many beats are in the bar, where the strong beats are, where the weak beats are, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, or one and two and three and four and one, two, three, four. Like to be able to hear all of that. Yeah. And then to be able to have a relationship with rhythm enough that if you hear a rhythm, you can repeat it back. Yeah. We, it, I, without it being very gray or, or blurry. Yeah, there, I mean, for, for people who are unfamiliar with music theory and musicianship, there are a number of um, approaches and methodologies, Kadai being one of them. The Suzuki mm -hmm. method being another, if I, if I remember correctly. Is it Suzuki? Oh, which one? Suzuki. Or Yamaha. Suzuki is ear is is ear, is ear based. Training? It starts out as ear based, and but it's for learning instruments. Uh, Dalcro's Eurythmics is another uh, one that is very very popular that deals a lot with with physical movement. Yeah, okay. So that you use movement yes. of your body to be able to interpret, um, particularly rhythm. It's called yep. Dalcro's Eurythmics, okay. and then Orf is another um, style, but that deals with percussion instruments and is often taught to younger people. And when I went and through, I. Sorry, I was just going to say when when I went through um, university, there was another um, approach called third stream ear training. Have you ever come across third stream? I might have by a different name. Oh, it was it it basically you needed a an a, a acoustics and a physics degree to do it, which is why I was <laughs> not very good at it. Um, I got <laughs> I, I passed, I passed Brenda, and that was mm -hmm. that was a win. Um, I, I just want to bring up a, a comment here, and this is, I think this is, this is from Linda. Linda's our wonderful moderator, actually, in our chat. Ooh, um, uh, hello. Yes, Linda is wonderful. And Linda is making a really good point, I think, and I want you to address this because she's saying it's simple. We're talking about really simple things, um, but she is saying, but it's not actually that easy, depending on the individual of the course, newbies to any instrument, we'll often find it challenging how do you not not necessarily respond to linda but how do you how do you work people through that those initial phases where yeah we need to take it from from that idea of it simply being said to be simple but then mm -hmm. applying it yeah so what i'm what i'm constantly saying to people in the process is i will let them know which what what it's going to what it will likely feel like during the process. So to say, you might be confused about this right now, the, or I'll, my joke is like, this one might hurt a little. <laughs> like just with the, the hamster will be running a little fur faster. There will be some sweating going on. You know, that's a lot of, I, and I never minimize that experience for people. And also I'm working with people who often have trauma around 
piano or have tried before and thought that they were stupid, which is why they can't. That was a lot of the singing teachers and singers mm. that I was first working with. They were like, I have a problem. I am stupid. I can't play piano. And some of these people were Grammy nominated singers. They were not stupid. They were some of the most musical people. Um, and so, I, you know, respecting the process, um, giving people a lot of, of time and a lot of support. Um, you know, my membership has like a community where there's like support that comes through and just, just talking people and walking people through the process and giving them a lot of opportunities to, to utilize it. Um, so the simple part for sure, easy, definitely not. So Linda's totally, totally bang on with that. But a lot of it, I mean, it's the same with singing. When we're trying to help somebody find their mix or their belt and they've never been able to do it and it's going to crack and it's like, oh, it sounds breathy. It sounds, you know, what do we say? It's like, this is, ex if it sounds breathy, you're doing something right. You know, yeah. if it cracks a little bit, that's what it's meant to do right now as we're moving through the process. Yeah. So it's normalizing process oriented work. Uh, and yeah. again, that's a real problem with our culture right now is everything is a product. Yes. But you know, it's, it's convincing people, reminding people that it's a, it's a, process process over product my my audience hear me saying that here at the uh, on the channel all the time you have mm -hmm. to enjoy the journey don't circumnavigate the journey it has too much to teach you the absolutely I, we we talked before we we pressed play for today's show we were talking about we share something in common and that is our our eclectic approach to our pedagogy and, you know, our, our um, passion for collecting, you know, methodologies, it, well, not methods, but, but approaches that, that yeah. have answers that work. To, tell us a bit more. I want to sort of pull out from the piano for a bit and in part because we're, <laughs> we're nearly out of time. I just want to hear a bit more from you about your your eclectic approach, you know, how, and, and let, feel free to talk about your singing teaching as well. Um, because I'm just yeah. loving that part. So I, you know, I'm a classically trained pianist. Yep. I still play classical piano every single day. And I've done, I've studied with some really heavy classical people. I have studied classical, um, choral conducting on a pretty high level too, and was conducting some pretty major works, uh, for a couple of years. And so that's just an area that I have, you know, not a crazy amount, like I'm not going to be doing a ton of that kind of stuff out in the world, but certainly done enough. But mixing that with the fact that I'm really at a fundamental level, a jazz musician. And so I really mm. look at all of the stuff I do through that lens of um, some of what we see is on the page. Most of what we are playing is not on the page the spirit of improvisation, you know, all of that is there. And then somewhere in there, this connection to pop music and songwriting and artists. And I have a really massive repertoire of like, I, I mean, there's, I could probably play several thousand songs, like just off the top of my head or with the lyrics in front of me, all of those things get put into the soup pot. <clears throat> and I don't really see, I don't have a hierarchy of those things. <clears throat> I don't have them in separate compartments or in different places. I've just kind of put them all in the same drawer. It's like my, my skill set is, is the junk drawer <laughs> with all the stuff in it. It's like there are spatulas and there's a bar of soap and, you know, a can of soup. You know, it's all these different things in there. And so at any time, and the same with my, my singing too, because I have studied classical singing at a pretty reasonable level. Again, good for choral singing, not going to be at the singing at the Met anytime soon, but very good choral singer, um, but really a jazz singer at heart, but who's sung a lot of popular musics, done a lot of choral singing and, you know, improvisi improvisation and things. And so all of these things are just all available at any time where it seems like it would come in handy. Mm -hmm. And I never quite know when these things are going to show up or why. It's a lot of times back to that creative energy of teaching where um, someone will come in and I'll think to myself, oh, this is a little out of left field, but there's a classical thing I'm going to show you that's going to make a difference. Yeah. Or um, there's a jazz thing that we do a lot that might be helpful. So I really, I mean, a junk drawer maybe isn't the best analogy for my work, but a potpourri, if you will, of, of different tools. And again, I don't qualify them 
I think that all of that is useful experience material to share. I don't think that the classical stuff is better than the jazz stuff or the jazz stuff is smarter than the, I, I just think of all of it as, as material that I, I have to share for people. Yeah, awesome. And, and Linda's just written a, a, a thank you for our talking to the, the content there before about um, learning and it being it's simple but not easy. So thanks Linda. Absolutely. For, yeah, thanks Linda for that comment. And I want to actually ask this question, not because Kelly has, oh, hang on a second. Well, Kelly's just made a, a comment, but I'm, I'm going to ask this question on behalf of Kelly, a long time um, watcher of our shows, because Kelly has been asking this question recently in some of our Q and A's. And that is, um, how, how did you find your, cause you've just spoken to the fact that you don't hold anything above anything else and and i completely agree with that neither sh mm -hmm. we shouldn't because art is all on an equal footing how did you find though having started in classical and come up through that ranks how did you settle into who you are today how did you find your your passion thread well, I, the, the funny thing about me is that I found many passion threads yeah. and there was a period of a couple of years where I was doing the bare minimum of jazz stuff because I was really obsessed with classical choral conducting. And so, you know, and then there were several years where I was really obsessed with when I was on the cruise ship, really obsessed with pop music and really getting inside all of that. And then for the last five years where I've been doing more online course creation and my membership and my YouTube channel where I've been kind of more open to presenting material for you know a different audience than I usually would be working with. So how do I break pop songs down to people? Um, that's been something that I've been really having a lot of fun with. I have a ton of tutorials on my channel where I'm like breaking it down to say, how can you sound like the record without it taking five years for you to learn it? And so I feel like that's been my thread has been, I'm always interested in something, I'm always reading about it or watching YouTube videos about it or listening to recordings or sitting and thinking about it and trying to solve the problem. So I would say that that's been the thread. <laughs> yeah. Oh okay. yeah, and Kelly says, you mean the old who am I and what am I supposed to do? Yeah, it's like sort of having a daily existential crisis of, of who am I now? <laughs> yeah. And it's funny as I, as I say that, um, I'm getting ready in October, I'm gonna be recording another album of my original music that's contemporary jazz, more of a jazz focus. But you know, I'm now back deep into that process again of like digging deep into this work and writing and the album itself is gonna be very, very unusual for the kind of work that I usually do. It has a, a very broader scope to it. So, you know, it's, it's really a lifelong process. And I, I think my students appreciate that because they know that I'm with them. I'm not, um, graduated from this. I'm not up on high on the rafters mm. going, I have the answers. You are, I have the same questions they have, you know, <laughs> why aren't I getting anything done in my practicing? Yeah. Is this the best chord for the occasion? You know, yeah. these are all of the, the universal questions that we're always asking. Is this the sound I want? Is this sound good? Um, you know, so I, I think that's, you know, part of, part of my, my charm is that I'm right down there in the, in the trenches with everybody else trying to figure out what the heck I'm doing. <laughs> and, and, and we, we here at the channel we, recently, we've been talking a lot about, um, certainly it's been in the zeitgeist of my, um, chatting with the community about fixed mindsets versus growth mindsets and that to, to express what you've just said, one needs a growth mindset. One, one has to always hold on to that sense that we have not arrived. Um, and, and that's, I think, you know, we were talking prior to the show, that's where, um, you know, with, withholding oneself from the idea of a method, you know, mm -hmm. it's, you know, I like in one, in, I, on my online courses, I at all costs avoid calling it a program or avoid calling it a method because I don't know, there's something that about that that just rubs me the wrong way. I always refer to it as a learning pathway, you know, that mm -hmm. that is yeah, I like that. I like that terminology. Malleable yeah. and moldable and 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 breathes because we don't know it all when it comes to voice, do we? We don't and you know, we're still 
there's still so much to discover and learn and so thank you so much for coming on to the today's show with such a gracious growth mindset and uh are, are there any parting points of wisdom that you would like to to leave us with sure i would say to anybody who is watching this or listening to this there there is nothing in any of this that is not available to you yeah. so if you want to sing you can sing if you want to play piano you can play piano if you want to build your ear training and play by ear it's all available and i think we both dan and i agree that absolutely anybody can learn to sing anybody can learn to play piano um nothing about this is rocket science you know like there's we're not trying to like cure cancer or anything here we're we're making music <laughs> and it is possible to do and it's really fun to do it's really engaging to do you can find a lot of meaning doing it yeah. and you know if you find people that are resonating their work is resonating with you to just give it a go and just mm. give it a try because the worst case scenario is you become a pretty reasonable singer and piano player yeah. you know and that's kind of amazing i mean what else are you going to do <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> some of the most joyous a lot, a lot more fun than just uh than just watching you know netflix <laughs> yeah some, some of the most you know, joyous lessons that i have with students are with students who come with the 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 pure innocent desire to learn a new skill absolutely There's, they're, they're not they're not they're not here to win a grammy they're just here to to explore to learn to play and uh and you know i just i love the fact that your course with the piano and and i know with your singing teaching as well you know that that people can do that with you so thanks for coming mm -hmm. on the show and sharing that um, and I, I know that there'll be so many people who can, you know, take full advantage of, of your online courses and they can get to it via piano and voice with brenda.com. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You can shoot me an email on there or check out, um, some of the stuff that's on there. There's a, I have a ton of free content and a couple of, um, cheap and cheerful little, um, mini workshops that you yeah. can sign up for and just give it a roll your sleeves up and give it a try. Yeah, roll, your, roll your sleeves up. I love it. Thank you so much for coming on to today's show, Brenda. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, it, was, it really was wonderful to have Brenda on with us. And uh, I really do encourage you to go and check out her website. If, you've, if, you've, if that's been you and you've thought to yourself, I can't learn to play piano. How am I ever going to do that? Go and check out, um, you know, what have you got to lose? Yeah, a little bit of money, a little bit of time, you know, but you might discover something wonderful. Uh, and uh, and I, I would really encourage you to do that if uh, the opportunity presents itself to you, which it kind of just did. <laughs> so go and check out her website. Um, next week, we're going to do a Q&A. Um, so make sure you come ready, armed, willing, able with your questions next week. I do my humble best to answer your questions. And uh, we always have a lot of fun in those shows as well. Can I just note we had another tech-free tech issue free show that's two in a row people uh, <laughs> if you've been watching for any length of time you know tech is an ever-present problem uh, but we got through today's show no problems at all which is great um, have a great week everyone i hope you i do hope you enjoyed today's show give it a thumbs up let us know and uh, we'll be sure to to take that on as encouragement to continue um, and uh, we will continue next week when i see you again soon i'm dr dan Sing well. <laughs>